Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on LinkedIn, Twitter, wherever you are. It's really good to have you here. It's been 13 seconds we kick off the show. Nine seconds. Eight. Ooh. Oh, no, I've forgotten my bow. Don't worry. There's other sounds here. Everyone, welcome, welcome. Live, here we are live. Live on LinkedIn, live on Facebook, everywhere. Thank you so much. Super, super cool to be here. We have just been having a little bit of fun, getting the microphones ready, getting everything. But this is what it's like in a modern virtual world. But the good news is, I think the pandemic is like calming down and hopefully we'll be able to meet in person. But actually, now we're going live. This is the first time that I've met Emma from Speaking at Work. And we have a mutual friend here, Tara Carl as well. And so it's super, super cool that today we're talking about an interesting topic. So in the past, uh, Emma, what we've done is we've talked about in terms of interviews, talk, going into an interview, preparing for interviews. However, one of the topics that me and Tara were talking about, which I know you, that you're an expert on, is that actually in interviews, it's not just about what you say. It's also about how you say these things. And it's also about body language as well. So you might be thinking about the words you're saying in the script. Meanwhile, your body's saying a million different things. Are you nervous? Are you this? And you're that. And so it's my pleasure um, to have you here today. But so Emma and Tara, first of all, how are you today? You both okay? I'm great. I'm feeling good. I'm sure we've scared Emma away. How are you feeling, Emma? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm feeling I'm feeling really pumped up. That music was brilliant. <laughs> yeah, I've got I've got more music and sound effects for you. Don't worry. But first of all, let's do a clap for you guys here. Really appreciate you here. Amazing. Okay, cool. And so so for, we'll, maybe we'll do around the room. So any anyone that doesn't know me already, I'm I'm part of the Architecture Social, and this is what the show's about. And and it's a, an architecture and design community. But Tara, for anyone that's not met you yet, perhaps we can introduce yourself quickly. Yeah, so obviously my first live with you, Stephen, but I yeah. am, I work for a company, my own company, Archie English, and I help people in the architecture industry to improve their language skills. So their, their English skills. So I guess that's, Amazing. that's a, a, different, a different thing to Emma, but yeah, I'd love to hear from you. What do you do? Amazing. So, as I help people raise their visibility and their credibility at work through finding their authentic voice so that they can get noticed for the right reasons and get the job, jobs that they want for the right reasons, get promoted for the right reasons, and sometimes leave what they're doing and go off and start something else amazing because they realize they can use their voices even more incredibly in a new arena. Amazing, amazing. And that's great. And so we'll probably mention briefly in case anyone wants to find you as well after this. So Tara, what's your website? And then Emma, we can we can go through yours as well. So Aki, Aki English, first of all, Tara, where do everyone find you? Yep. So everyone this? can find me on archieenglish.com. So Aki is A-R-C-H-I English. I get a few people calling it Archie English occasionally, but it's Aki <laughs> English. <laughs> Archie English sounds so adorable, doesn't it? <laughs> and and yeah. Emma, we, we'll jump into the nitty gritty. But first of all, if anyone wants to follow up with you after this as well, speaking at work, where can they find that? Is your web web your web address? Yeah, that's my web address. But find me on LinkedIn. Just Emma Wayner on wink, LinkedIn. That's how we roll. Amazing. So I tell you what, I love Tara's topic today. So first of all, let's talk about that in an interview because I've done them as well. The first few interviews that you ever get in your in your life, if there's any graduates here, um, especially away and, and even further in your career, doing an interview is a very nerve wracking process. And so naturally, your body language can be going all over the shop. Um, however, uh, as at the same time as well, I'm sure there's some things that we can talk about so that people are aware of maybe body language and things that you can do inadvertently to calm yourself down or control and get composure as well. So I've noticed that that whenever I get nervous in particular, like now you can see I've got a bit, I get a bit of nervous energy and I get pumped up when I move around. However, sometimes what I've noticed when I've been doing interviews with people, people can when they get nervous, they kind of close up and they have all all this stuff going on. But this is an open conversation, and 
I would love to hear you guys as experts of English and experts of body language to, to, to basically give me your thoughts on that. So should we start then in terms of an interview, how people feel? Tara, do you want to lead first and then we can, yeah, so, then we can have a chat? And I guess the re like a good way to start would be to why I thought this would be a good conversation is that mm -hmm. I work with a lot of people who want to prepare things beforehand and they prepare mm -hmm. their English beforehand and what they need to say, but they don't necessarily give as much thought to the body language aspect of it. So they might prepare exactly what they're going to say. So they sound a bit like a robot sometimes right. and not necessarily think as much about the body language. And I think for me, that's the most important, you know, even when I'm practicing with them, they're sort of got their head down and trying to think of what they need to say. So this is why I really think that body language is even more important at times, more important than what you say, it, I think sometimes. So Emma, I'd love to hear from you. What are your thoughts in terms of how does somebody prepare for an interview? They've prepared what they need to say. They've prepared everything that they might expect, but what do they need to do with their body language? What are some of the things you would say to prepare? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I'm going to even, I'm going to take it back a step even further because mm. um, everything that you think will leak out of your body somehow or another. We're leaky as, as individuals, unless you've trained as a spy, and I'm guessing not many of the listeners have, <laughs> or you're an incredible con artist. Everything that we think leaks out somehow or another. So right. we almost need to go back a step. So beyond like what we're going to say, we have to go back and think about what is it that I'm bringing to the situation? What, what am I really, really good at? And one of the things I encourage people to do is to make two lists when they're going into an interview. One is like your technical list. So all the technical skills that I have, everything that you've learned through your training, everything you've learned through your previous jobs, what are all the technical skills that this particular company might be interested in hearing about from you? And then on the other side is to write all your, now people call these soft skills, but I like to think of them as power skills because actually they're incredibly useful. So are you a collaborative worker? Do you notice when someone else in the team is off? Do you listen for detail? Um, all those kind of smaller things that actually really are important that, that emulate all your values and your behaviors. If you can kind of really hone in and focus on those and your technical things, it really helps kind of begin a confidence cycle in our mind, which then will lead into the body. You know, those, you know, you know what I mean? Like you have those days, your alarm goes off late or it doesn't go off at all. And you wake up and you're like, ah, oh, for the rest of the day. And everything is kind of frenetic. You're running behind and your body language and your sort of mental state are, oh, this is not a good day. It's the same thing when we're going into an interview. We want to get ourselves into this really sort of positive mindset, a good mindset, not overly pumped and hysterical. And no, we, don't, we don't want the sort of we want it to be truthful because we want to go into that interview and be authentic. We want to be real when we walk into that room. So thinking about all the things you're really, really good at beforehand will feed into your body language for sure. I think that's really important too, because particularly with the people that I work with, they might sometimes go into an interview with a very um, a negative mindset or they think they have insufficiencies. So I like what you're saying about trying to figure out what your value is, what, what are your strengths and leading leading with your strengths into the into the interview and therefore you might feel more confident when the questions are asked of you yeah absolutely yeah i mean to give you an example so my the, the way i think about my stuff is i'm a catalyst so I, I walk into a room and it doesn't matter what i'm teaching it could be conflict or it could be leadership it could be interview skills but i'm offering some ideas that might help somebody change and become something more and that might happen then or in two weeks or in a year's time so if it doesn't work it doesn't click for somebody there and then it's not it's okay it's not it's not such a big deal but it makes me feel confident and positive when I walk into that room thinking this is what I offer above and beyond the technical stuff that I'm talking about does that make sense mm. yeah absolutely important I love yeah. it. I love it. We've got some people that have said hello when we're coming in as well. So I'm sure everyone can hear, can see all the comments here. And there's one or two comments that I will definitely not be bringing up on the live stream. <laughs> you know who you are, naughty people on, on Twitch, but 
It's so many good to see everyone from the architecture community here as well. So what I would say is anyone that's watching this here, it's an opportunity because we are live to ask questions on the flow. So anything that we say in particular, if you want to kind of go into more details on that, or you want to ask the panel, you want to ask Emma a question or Tara a question or me, I think um, please do jump in. And just to touch upon that point, I love what you said actually, Emma, because what's interesting is Sometimes I feel like when people are rehearsing things for an interview, the one tip that I try to do is, like you said, you think about the core values that you offer. What I try to get people to do, though, is not to rely on the script. Because, as you said, if you kind of take in these points in and they soak into you, then when you're having a conversation, those will be embedded, but you're allowed to maneuver along on the conversation in the interview. And I find that when someone worries about going along a, a script, actually it's not engaging because there isn't that conversation there. And when a question comes off the script, then the computer kind of breaks down and it's that meltdown. And you can see in the person's mind, they all the cogs going of what to answer. And, and that's what I really like about your strategies because that list or those core values, uh, why, you know, what are they going to achieve? So I think that's really a great point. And so as well as that list, so in terms of, we talked about body language, we're talking about different things as well. It's very easy to get nervous before an interview. And I think that actually, when you're going into an interview, it's okay to be nervous per se, but how, is there any, uh, what, what would you think Tara or Emma, what have you seen a few strategies to kind of overcome nervousness? I think for me, the, the first thing would be practicing and, and not necessarily practicing the same questions all the time. So, yeah. and, and also practicing with different people as well. So you see different situations, um, mm. different, different conversations with people as well. Um, mm. But also I try to get people to think about being in the moment because yeah. I think we've had conversations before about how what can happen is if you're trying to think about what's the best thing to say, you're yeah. not thinking, you're not listening to what people are saying to you. So what one thing that I, I say is to so wear something on your wrist or to write something on your hand that reminds you to stay in the moment. So mm -hmm. for example, I get a lot of my clients to write smile on their hand or, or just something little so that they remember, oh yeah, oops, I'm just, I've got to be in the moment. So that's kind of what I would, I suggest to get them to do, because I think for me, the biggest thing is the listening. And as, as you were saying before, I like what you're saying, how, you know, they try to rehearse a script and then it comes out really robotic and not really natural. So it's trying to get them to think about how they can be in the moment. Yeah. yeah. Emma, what, what's difference. your thoughts? There's, I think there's a big difference between listening and waiting. And mm. I think we're very uh, good at waiting. <laughs> we, yeah. we have, like, they're asking the question and we're like, yeah, we've already decided in the first few words what we're going to say and we're not really listening. So it doesn't give us a chance to think about why are they asking me that question? Because you're already yeah. prepping your answer. Because they're asking you that question not necessarily because they want the technical answer to it. They might want more. They might want to see how you approach the problem. They might want to see what your teamwork was like within that question. So you really have to listen to the whole question and be mm. able to think, why are they asking me this? Um, so that you can answer it in the right way. And so Tara's absolutely right. If we're, if we're waiting and we're not totally present to what the other person is saying, we're probably not going to answer it to the best of our ability. We're certainly not going to give them the kind of answer that they might be looking for. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think um, I tend to do that whenever I'm more likely to be nervous or if you're distracted or anything, you're right. I, I've had that where you you already know the answer in your mind and then you're not actually engaging into the conversation. And that's so common. That's a lot of people do that. And I think that I would hear the expression before it's different types of listening. Is that right, Emma? And so you've got diagnostic listening is probably the best form of listening where you're in the moment you're hearing what people are saying, and then you're able to answer uh, and add conversation based upon what they actually say, not yeah. the pre-existing script that you're on about where you have that answer and you're not hearing a word they're saying, you're just waiting for that gap to speak. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. 
And sometimes yeah. you want to clarify that question as well. So it can, you, you know, you may have, they may ask a question in quite a broad way and you say, okay, would, would, are you looking for more information about this element of it or should I tell you about this? Because sometimes, you know, you could take a question in two different ways, but if they've asked it in a very broad way. So if you're really listening, you have an opportunity to respond like that, which shows great listening skills. So it's a really good um, demonstration of your skills if you can do that. Mm. Emma, I'd like to ask sort of what, what were some of the things that you would suggest to people who, who do speak English as a second language, for example, and that's, that's quite a stressful thing for them to do, to be able to listen and to what are some of the things that you might suggest for reducing stress in that situation or uh, sometimes I think too it's, it's trying to get them to be okay with pauses, for example, or, or, or not being like just wanting to put their answer out there so quickly because that can be something that can happen too. It's just they just talk so quickly because they want to get over and over, you know, over the interview. They want to just get out of there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think there's two things. So when we wait, when we're not really listening, when we're waiting, we tend to hold our breaths. Mm. We're, we're waiting for, for our opportunity <laughs> to get in there. So we actually genuinely, you can, you, now you've, I've said this, you watch, uh, people <laughs> hold their breaths when they're waiting and not listening. So we hold our breath. So it makes, actually makes it harder to continue listening, weirdly. But, uh, something happens to your ear and there's also a, a brain pressing thing that happens you stop listening um, so if you if you just number one you need to have your feet on the floor I know that sounds really weird but actually it really helps you breathe more deeply oh I better put my feet on the floor <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it does lots of other good things too but um, yeah it really helps you breathe more effectively um, and so you can really listen to the question and then if you're breathing you can have time to respond. So rather than reacting to a question, I'm going to say this, you're going to yeah. respond. So you have a moment to kind of go, hmm, okay, I'm going to tell them about this bit because that's really what they're asking. And yeah. I think with ESL speakers, I think there's two things that I have found um, over the years of working that people are concerned about not being understood because of their accent. I've only ever worked with one person who was making sound substitutions so it was difficult for me to understand what she was saying because she was using the wrong sounds. So it, it, we needed to do work on that. For most ESL speakers, um, there's, there's two things. Uh, and the first thing is exactly what you said is pace. Mm. Talk too quickly. I talk so, so quick. You know, yeah, we want to get out of the gate. We want to answer that question because I know what I'm going to say. And, you know, brrr, it all comes out. So it, the, the, that makes it difficult for your listener to understand, and it also means that you look less like an expert. Experts hold the space. They speak a little bit more slowly. They take mm. their time. They use pauses. So particularly if it's complex or it's weighty, we need a pause to understand what somebody said. And then the second element is about jaw. So in quite a lot of the romantic languages, the jaw position is really tight. So it stays here. Yes. So if I if I just hold my jaw now and just continue to speak, it's much harder to understand what I'm saying. And I'm a native English speaker. <laughs> if I relax my jaw and start moving my jaw, I'm not doing anything else. I'm not louder. I'm not slower. I'm not faster. You can understand what I'm saying much more. So I think those two things. People worry about getting their English perfect. They worry about being accent free. And actually, those things don't matter. We like listening to interesting, different voices. Mm. just need to be able to hear it at a pace that we can take in everything that's been said and we just need a little bit more jaw movement to make it clearer and louder. Yeah, and I think that's interesting what you're saying too because you know, a lot of the romantic languages are actually syllable time language, so they're very consistent paced, whereas English yep. is much more singy-songy and stress yeah. time, so it's, yeah. it's, it's much harder to kind of get into that, that pace and rhythm but it's practice that, that helps that to come. Yeah, really mm. emphasizing the words that you want to land with your, your listener, really important. Mm. Yeah, I think it's really important to practice stress, for example, and, and listen to how other speakers put stress on particular words to emphasize certain things. Mm. Definitely. Mm. I'm acutely aware of my jaw and my feet and my breathing right now. I'm so, so aware. I'm I've so... got my both feet on the ground right now and I'm feeling very, I'm feeling relaxed actually. That's good advice. Yeah. It's, yeah. Tr it's, it's true though when you said, I was thinking about it and 
you're right. When you wait, when you when you're listening. You're not, you're not, your breathing is totally different. Well, we've actually got one or two questions. We've got one professional question that's come in. I'll tell you what will make you laugh because we, this goes out everywhere, right? And people can post different comments and one of them on Twitch. And I was just looking at some of the comments that come through and don't worry, we're not gonna put them on the live stream. We're not gonna put them on LinkedIn. But I was like, that is totally distracting because I was trying to listen to what you're saying. And then I've got this like gamer kid on like Twitch that's saying like the most inappropriate stuff. <laughs> Dude, you can keep going, but I'm, you're not going on the live stream. However, no. we have a really professional question from Gabriella, who says, Hi guys, very happy to be here, hearing and learning uh, more from you. I'm Brazilian, I'm an architect, but unfortunately, I don't have much work experience. Because of my lack of experience in English, being my second language, I don't feel confident in interviews. Any advice from my case? So. I think we all have advice, but maybe what we can do in this situation is perhaps Tara, we can hear from you and then Emma and then how, and then what I can do at the end is I can offer one or two bits of advice. And then between us, hopefully uh, Gabriella will have three different perspectives on the same issue and the same, you know, the same case, what we can talk about. So Tara, yeah. what would your... Uh, suggestion be to the fantastic Gabriella. It's a great, presence. great question. Thank you, Gabriella, for this question. I think there's lots of things you can do in terms of when you don't have much work experience. You still have experience that you have have from school and 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 what your learning is. So I would say, in terms of confidence, confidence is a big thing that to build up, and you can do that by practicing speaking about projects or sp speaking about things that you value, particularly about design. And so that's what I tend to do with a lot of my clients is when they're having an interview or or when they're needing to build confidence for work, I get them to explain projects, what they value about design, and just really getting them to practice a lot of speaking exercises so they become more confident about what they value. And I think it's also a good exercise, as Emma was saying at the start, to understand what you value and mm. when you when you have a really good understanding about what you value it it makes it easier to talk about and and you build the confidence around that so and and i i also like what emma was saying too about it's not we're not necessarily worrying so much about perfect english or the perfect accent we we really want to try and bring that aspect of your experience to to the interview we want to know what's your experience from Brazil, for example. What what do you notice about the difference between Brazil and and London, for example, or where, wherever it is that you're living? So trying to think about some of those things that you can bring that come from your own experience that might be different and unique to, say, somebody who's just lived in England or lived in Australia mm -hmm. or wherever. So I think it's it's really putting yourself in those those experiences, speaking a lot and and feeling more and trying to feel more confident yeah i think that's i think that's some really sound advice there and so emma do you have anything to add to gabriella that may be you know good advice along that point if you're not feeling confident going into an interview yeah um i would encourage you to watch the ted talk by amy cuddy um okay. uh, i can't remember off the top of my head what it's called but essentially when we're nervous we, as Stephen kind of alluded to at the beginning, we close our bodies down. So we make ourselves yeah. smaller. So if, if I made myself smaller and I tilt my camera so I'm, I'm little and I'm down here, <laughs> I don't really look or sound like an expert anymore. I, I sound like a little girl. So mm. by taking up the right amount of space, we can make ourselves feel more confident and our body language feeds up into our mind. So I would definitely go and watch the, the TED Talk by Amy Cuddy if you can. It's C-U-D-D-Y. And she talks about how we can physically take up space um, and not, not step into arrogance, but just take up the right amount of space and how that actually changes the hormones in our body, makes us feel more confident and less stressed. So that would be my advice. Go watch Amy Cuddy. She's amazing. I love that TED Talk. Great, great advice. I'm going to go watch oh. it after this. <laughs> I haven't seen it. Oh, in for a treat then. Thank you, Emma. That's, that's, that's amazing. What I was going to say, Gabriella, is um, even from what you said now, don't 
undersell yourself or even the way you phrase the question, you're worried immediately. You're saying that you don't have a lot to offer because of a lack of work experience. And by even saying that, you're kind of condemning yourself to this label and fate that you've put on yourself when actually you do have a lot to offer. And that's what the interview is about. It's about communicating that. But the more and more that you you become more comfortable and as you said, maybe use some suggest, so the suggestions that Tara has talked about and Emma and the more and more you understand yourself and you forgive yourself for maybe a lack of experience here or there, actually you get over that quite quickly. And also if an interviewer is inviting you for an interview, there's some potential there. And we're all human beings. So as in if you have work experience in Brazil and you're worried about the fact that it's not in the UK, what you've got to do there is you've got to remember it's still really good experience, but you need to explain what qualities are transferable and talk about that. So you can say, well, I'm aware that maybe the UK building regulations are different. However, I've done this in Brazil and this would be similar. And Using techniques like that is going to make you feel much more comfortable because you're being ra you're being rational. You're being you. It's it's quite a sensible thing to talk about with your employer by actually hitting the issue head on where you feel like you haven't got experience in certain aspect and you can talk to them about you know the fact of you have this skill set and also you can draw into it gabriella the lots of good value added you can think you can do to the practice so have a think about what you before you're going in all the software you've done the experience you've got the different cultures your perspectives you know the fact that you're you you're from different cultures and all that is amazing and, and i think i was saying well, in the chat last week with a specialist in industry talking about diversity and inclusivity tara was there as well and this is really really important to the fabric of an architecture practice so it's definitely not a weakness it's definitely a strength so oh we've actually got another question that's come in here tara and emma let's see I'm just double checking. It's not the um, the gamer crew on Twitch, <laughs> Twitch which is question. sending us which is sending us crazy stuff. But um, so AJ says, "Hey guys, thanks for the insight. Wanted to ask what questions are a no no when it comes to asking the interview panel's questions." Wow, that's an interesting one. So first of all, AJ, I'll jump in with this one. I I think generally no questions. Um, you can ask whatever question you want. You just have to have a level of sensibility and professionalism with it. I do think, though, it's generally good to ask questions. Easy questions. Think about what questions are useful to you. So when you're speaking to, um, to someone who's interviewing you, remember the interview is two ways. It's just as much for you as it is for them. So you can say, what is the work-life balance like? Or what do you enjoy about working at your uh, at your architecture practice and and um, you know how do you balance your own life versus the office or you could be stuff like what projects are on at the moment what do you look for in employees what are you most proud of and open questions like that are really going to engage the architecture practice. What current projects are you working on right now? What are you excited about? Uh, did you do you do frequent work? Um, outings and events and then then you know the conversation will open up hopefully and they'll be like yeah you know pre-covid we used to go out all the time or we have a company yacht and suddenly then you can talk about oh the fact oh i love sailing and so the conversation goes on so i think ask open-ended questions where which you want to learn about the business i think that is a really great example of things that you could ask and i guess in terms of no no's common sense maybe don't ask anything deeply personal or rude or like uh Political. what's the minimum hours i have to work or you know you maybe you don't want to say something like that which is all like or like yeah you know um is it okay if like um i shoot off at three o'clock every day maybe you don't want to say something like that but generally i think if it's engaging and because you want to learn about the company then that's going to come across quite well but uh, tara do you have any thought for aj's on no nose of questions to ask in an interview oh i think you've hit the nail on the head i think you've covered all the questions that are that are good to ask i think i would the one that i would say is political questions are always very difficult to oh. to ask i think it's best to avoid those types of questions um yeah 
religion maybe is another one that's probably something that you should avoid. <laughs> Yeah, it, well, and you can ask, you know, maybe how many people in the practice are from different nationalities and cultures or how important is that? But yeah, yeah. you don't want to be like, what's your religion? Because it's yes, like, exactly. dude, we're talking about the architecture <laughs> work here as well. But kind of an interesting point, maybe to add parallel to when AJ is talking about particular questions, the body language with these questions, when you're asking questions back to an interviewer is so important as well. Because if I went like, yeah, um, yeah, I'm not really, I'm really thought of any questions, but maybe what time mm. does everyone clock off? Um, do you kind of, can I go at like bang on the door? If I said it with that body language and that look, you're thinking like this guy just literally wants to do the minimum. Mm. However, if you phrase the question like, look, I really want to work hard when I'm there and work-life balance is important to me. However, I have a family, I have a child to pick up at the end and I have to balance my what I do in my work and my personal life appropriate. So what kind of hours do you do in the office? With that engaging attitude, that's much less of a defensive or like um, a lackluster and enthusiastic response to the question. So... I mean, AJ, mm. that's something I would think about as well. But mm. what, what do you think, Tara and Emma, about that? Is that a fair point? Or do you have any um, thoughts yeah. on, along that wavelength? I think also one thing I say to people is when, when they ask you that question, because it's inevitable they ask that question, I talk about expressions like, that's a really great question, or thank you for asking me that question, or uh, this is what I... And it makes you... It makes you look prepared, makes you think that you, or makes you seem like you've thought about an answer for that question. So I think it's important to, to, as as we were talking about before, slowing down the response and saying, well, thank you for asking me that question. And I always say too, thinking about that, is that when you say something like that, it also gives you time to think about mm. the response. So I do that a lot. Oh, that's a great question. And in the, in the, in my head, I'm thinking about the answer. So I would say that's a good way to do it. What do you think, yeah. Emma? I agree, because it, it acknowledges that the question's been asked of you. So mm. you're saying, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm listening. And then you've got a bit of space to answer it. I think in terms of body language, I think there's two things that, that I would say is, if you are going to, if you're saying about your work-life balance because you have to leave because you've got children and you need to pick them up, one of the things you don't want to be doing when you're saying that, saying, you know, work-life balance is really important to me because I've got children and I need to be picking them up. So if I'm moving away from the screen, yeah. I'm losing power. <laughs> okay. Oh, you're, that's you're interesting. I noticed that. <laughs> yeah, you're basically saying it's okay for you to disagree with me because I'm very low status and that's fine. So yeah, you can just tell yeah. me I have to work till nine o'clock every night. Okay. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, so we don't want to lose status. So if we're going to make a kind of covert because that's a covert request a covert request or an inquiry we need to keep strong in the body so we're not leaning away from the screen um and the opposite to that is when they're asking you something that you're really interested about you're really excited about you know you can you can lean in i mean it doesn't work quite so well virtually you have to be a bit more subtle about it <laughs> yeah but you don't want to be like this do you yeah, no. Uh, but if you're face to face, like leaning in when you get excited about something is totally acceptable and shows you're enthusiastic and passionate. Look, I mean, it's really hard to become an architect. You've got to be dedicated. You've got, you've got to love what the, you're going to do. You're going to spend seven years of your life qualifying, you know, but that's before you get, you know, really stuck into the work. So, mm. you know, you're showing enthusiasm through your body language, through gesture, through your tone of voice. Really, really important. Because mm. you can't teach somebody that. I can, te you know, I can teach you technical skills. I can teach you how to do these, you know, even client management stuff. I can't teach you enthusiasm and passion. So that really needs to come across in your body language and your tone of voice. Yeah. There was something that we were talking about, Emma, which was about um, what it means in a job interview in terms of body language. And you were talking about aligned, opened and release. Yeah. Could you explain that a little bit more? Because I think that's a really great... Um, way of looking at body language in an interview. Yeah, so we really want to try to create rapport really quickly with the other person. So one of the ways that we can do that uh, is through our body language. So as a practical thing, so very first thing uh, in these days of, of um, digital interviews, it's about status on the screen. So whenever we move into any kinds of situations, we're always thinking about status. You know, comedy is predicated on the fact that we mess around with status. That's why it works. That's why it's funny. So 
we want to try and equalize the status between us and the interviewer um, because we want this to be a conversation. You know, it's not an interrogation and it's not a lecture. Yeah. So we need it to be a conversation. So where we need to be on the screen is about a third of the screen is empty. About the third of the screen is your head. Oh, no. And then... I need to recalibrate. <laughs> One second. I should have done it like this. That's better, isn't it? I'm feeling it? a bit like I need I'm to be like this in the core and the flunk. Uh, I'm, like, I'm not going to get the job. <laughs> and then the third is your body. So and your, your, your hands and your arms. What you don't want is, is to be down here and just see the tips of your fingers if you're moving them oh, around. Because no. that looks a bit strange. And, and again, if you're too small, not an expert. If I, if I, go, if I go like this. <laughs> you know i'm suddenly in charge and i'm lecturing you and, and it yeah doesn't work yeah so we have what to about really... the hands what do you do with your hands in a well i guess in a a face-to-face -face interview but then also in a, a virtual interview face-to-face -face, absolutely use your hands yeah if you're someone who talks with your hands use them yeah Just make sure your water is not too close <laughs> <laughs> disaster oh gosh yeah. yeah so make sure that if you're if you if you generally gesticulate and most people do i say to people if you were going to go to the pub and, and tell your friends about something that happened yesterday would in the days that we could go to the pub but you know what i mean <laughs> would you use your hands most people say yeah. well yes so why yeah. not why wouldn't you use them when talking in a professional situation mm. i would yeah. always say though that they do need to underline what you're saying so if I continue to talk to you and I'm just kind of randomly moving my hands, they start to become a bit of a distraction because you're not really listening to any of the words. <laughs> yeah, just true. watching your yeah. hands fly across exactly. the, the screen. Yeah, because they're bigger and they're moving. And so because of our sort of protection system, we, we watch the moving things because that's like, that could eat me. So we need to, <laughs> um, the, the movement of your hands, it really needs to kind of underline everything you're saying. So if you're asking questions, we use nice open, you know, so, you know, so if you're saying, well, what did you think about that? Or what are your thoughts? Or, you know, a great question is, what do you think the challenges are going to be for the uh, architecture industry in the next three years? Mm. Um, we want to use open gestures. Whereas if we're saying about what we did to a project and how we affected the success of a project, we want to use much more linear, much more straightforward gestures that are really kind of, making sure that they underline that this is us we did this mm. wow yeah. I, I might and, and, i might need i might need you uh you can maybe i can be <laughs> one of your clients emma teach me how to do more professional live streams but those <laughs> i'm i'm gonna watch the replay of this good thing that it's good thing it's my live stream i can replay it but that's that's some really good little tips there and what i would say not uh, it, which is interesting when you were talking about that I was thinking, based on my experience in architectural recruitment the last seven years, yeah. people make decisions on emotion backed up by rationale. And yeah. so what I find really interesting is that if there are two candidates going to the interview and one candidate, and they have the equal skill, but one candidate builds up more of a rapport, okay, they're going to get the job offer and what i've seen sometimes is actually someone is more skilled than the other person but the person which has less skills they have the enthusiasm they bought the they've they become relatable they more they feel like they're more engaged and actually i've seen it that the hiring manager will offer the job to the person that they feel is a more connection with because and i've had it where they go oh steve the thing is mary she had all the skills but it just it wasn't there whereas jeff he was really up for it okay i've got to train him on this aspect but he was interested he was excited he wanted to go the extra mile and i really could use someone on my team with that attitude so all the stuff that you're talking about and conveying emotion and being engaged and all these little bits it really does make a huge difference and i think it could be the the it's what seals the deal and what gets you a job definitely we make huge decisions we buy houses like the biggest amount of money we'll ever spend in our lives after we've walked into the place once. Yeah. It's, it's like you say, but we make it based on a gut decision. It's like, it feels right. So just like you've described, you know, the interviews, it just didn't feel right with the other person. And it does come down to that kind of energy. We tend to think that we need to justify why we're good for a job and, and you know, use all these kind of, you know, reasons why we're good. And, you know, and it all becomes very logical. 
but that doesn't sell you in terms of emotion. It doesn't, it doesn't connect with the other person's heart, if you like. They're not yeah. thinking, oh, this, this person would be an amazing addition to our, our group, our community, our, our office. So we have to kind of appeal to the heart and the mind. And the heart, like you say, it, does, it just comes from the enthusiasm and the passion and the drive and the energy that you bring to a situation. But nobody's looking for perfect. We're, we're always looking for the best fit possible. And everybody, whoever you are, will always need training on something. No one's yeah. ever an expert, ever, ever, ever. You never stop learning. You never stop, you know, being able to grow. So, you know, being an expert when you start your career is about how can you apply the knowledge that you've got really, really well. Mm. it's not about knowing everything mm. I, I so, love that <laughs> I think it's I think that's great I and so what we've got we've got questions coming in thick and fast I feel like <laughs> everyone's loving it but actually my mouse is just frozen for one second so let me pass that up <laughs> and we'll get the next I'll bring the question on the screen just plugging it in now but Sean Page says that the fit in a Oh, there we go. My mouse is back. Yay! This house is so much better, isn't Here it? Here we go. The fit in film culture is most important. As Emma said, we can train technical skills, not personality. Thank you for offering your two cents, Sean. So we've got we've got two questions here that have popped up. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna bring on Maria's question. Uh, there we go. So Maria says, This is so helpful. Thank you. Well, Tara and Emma, that's all down to you. So <laughs> what is the best way? to tell them, and I'm guessing that's an employer, that you really want to work for, um, in their company. So I, I'm going to just jump in quickly on that point and say that I, I think it's a little bit about what we're talking about now. I think when you when you go into the interview, if you can bring in that um, enthusiasm, genuine enthusiasm and genuineness will always override nervousness. And so whenever I've done interviews for my team, I, I'm not, I do not mind when people are nervous because that's just the fact of life. And I've been nervous before, but the enthusiasm to work for me on, on my team is super, super important and an engaging conversation. And wh what's interesting is that when I've interviewed people to go on my team, I remember that before when you've, you've never conducted an interview, you almost can feel like interviews are there to catch you out. Like it's a test. You know, and like like the employer is going, aha, you failed, get out. And it's not like that at all. Actually, when you're conducting an interview, you're trying to find someone which will solve a problem. So there's that aspect of they they need to tick the job, but you, it's also that aspect of if I'm hiring someone to work with me, they've got to learn, I've got to train them up, or maybe if they're working someone next to me, I've got to feel like I can get along with them. And so, so I think that there's, an aspect of you can tell someone that you want to work with them but it's through your attitude and mannerisms that you, what will happen Maria is it will come across that you're interested in it but actually the when I'm making the decision who I hire it's partly based upon the fact of who I would like to work with and the attitude there so all this stuff that Emma and Tara are talking about in terms of how to present yourself, how to showcase your enthusiasm, how to engage and, as you say, not do this and kind of not be too intimidating is, is super, super important. Tara, um, I mean, what's your, your thoughts on, on building upon this um, subject? I mean, we touched upon it a bit. Do you want to add one or two final thoughts to Maria and then we can bring on Benjamin's question? Yeah, I think um, what I've learned from doing coaching is that the best way for somebody who's listening to you to feel like heard and, and feel engaged is to actually ask them questions. Mm -hmm. So without saying, I really want to work for you because this, because you've done this project and, and I think I'll be good for this project, ask lots of questions like, mm -hmm. who are you looking for? What, what sort of projects are you working on? And then you can add your expertise. So if you say we're looking for somebody that, that's working on this type of project and then you can bring your expertise or your interests or your passions into the answer so rather than leading with the, this is me ask as many questions as you can because that shows you're engaged and you and you're interested in in the type of work that they're doing so i would say questions are very powerful and more powerful than people realize mm. Mm. And i think so. i think adding in the kind of why to that as well so what kind of projects are you working on and they might give you a few examples like okay so what why are you focusing on those particular 
mm. types of projects. What, what is important to the company about that particular style of design or that particular style of project so that you're really kind of getting down more to the core value of, of why they exist rather than what they're doing. Why are they doing what they're doing? Because at that stage, you might find it easier to relate what, what you believe in. You know, when you go into architecture, you know, you, you, like any industry, you have kind of ideals about how you want your skills to play out in this world. So like you want to connect with them on a, a much more emotional kind of core value level. So going a bit deeper and asking, right, so why is that important? What, what's that going to get the company? Where are you going? Those kinds of things really start to make a proper, like deeper connection and conversation. Yeah, I love that question. That's a great question to ask. And I think it, it, it can be a risk to offer your passions and your interests without understanding where they're coming from. So obviously, um, as Sean's saying in the comments, it's, it's important to do your research about the, 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 the company and, and what exactly they're looking for. But, but at the same time, you're not always going to know exactly what they're, are, they're looking for. So that's where you have that opportunity in the interview to ask them the questions. And so, and I also think for a lot of the people that I work with, it's surprising to them sometimes that the more questions you ask, it takes a lot of the pressure off them because they can be asking questions and waiting for the answers and, and, and it gets them more in the moment and trying to listen. Mm. Really, really well said. So I've got one or two more questions which have popped up here. I know we're scheduled for an hour, we're at 45 minutes, which is awesome. Just for anyone that's joined us, just for a recap as well, you've got the fantastic Emma from Speaking at Work, you've got Tara Carl at Archie English, and you've got me, Stephen Drew, from the Architecture Social, and we have been smashing this subject, and actually I'm really, really enjoying it so far. So what I was gonna say, uh, Olivia's got a quick question, which I can touch upon briefly, but then I'd love to go into Benjamin's question as well. So Olivia talks about, uh, she had an interview where she was told to quickly go through portfolios. So, a portfolio in architecture can be 30 pages and she panicked and I completely get that right. because the portfolio can be a long document and if you spend so long on it when someone goes yeah yeah quickly go through it it's like <gasps> and especially like if we talked about earlier if you've done if you rehearsed this all the time and you spent one minute two minute on a page suddenly someone asking you to go through a document quickly is going to be um, a little bit um, of a, a jolt to the system so what is the best way to quickly talk about your portfolio? So I, I have a tip for that, um, if it's cool with everyone here to talk about it. So the first thing I always do say is with a portfolio, especially if, if it's online, you have a lot less of control than say now me and Emma sitting on a table going through a portfolio. So you've got to walk someone through it online. So the tip that I use is that a little bit like what Tara said, you need to engage the um, the interviewer so the thing i would say is that here's my portfolio I, I we can go through it at a quick pace however if there's any particular page that you want to go in more detail feel free to stop and we can drill into that and i'm more than happy to answer any questions and so what i would say olivia is if you can rehearse the long version but i want you to be okay with the short version and you need to think about it. it's exactly like what emma said at the start about the core points of what you add as an employee you need to think about the core points of your portfolio so that you can answer on the fly maybe they just want to see residential buildings at technical stages and you can go okay no problem the front end of my project here is design we can return to that later let's focus on the technical aspects so by including the interviewer in that process you can navigate that document of many pages easily and you're being reasonable by saying to them if you want to zoom in on any page or if we want to go in one detail uh, into detail on one page they have the control and that kind of works with the the what you've practiced but what you're doing is that mental switch in your head of just being okay to mix up the formula um that's kind of my thoughts uh tara and emma i mean do you have anything you'd like to add to that or is that a good idea or do you have your own ideas on on presenting like a document in an interview I think that's, yeah, I think what you're saying is, is really important. And I think one thing I try to emphasize to the people that I work with is to know what, know what insight you have on a project. So don't just say, for example, this is a section, this is a plan. People don't 
they already know that they want to know more information about the plan so when i'm working with people what i try to say to them is think of one insight what's something interesting that you learned uh, what would you do differently next time and so if you only have 30 seconds to explain a page you've got one thing already ready to go and then the other thing i think it's it's good to have it as a conversation so somebody that i worked with just recently we talked about how she had a 30 page folio and she only had two minutes to present so i said maybe at the start use a lot of signposting like saying i have 30 pages in my portfolio but what i'd really like to do is present these two projects because i think they show these skills the best so really emphasizing you you'd have some of the control but but you're really telling this story. You already know what this story is. And so keeping it short, they don't need to know every single thing that happened in your portfolio because they'll have gone through it already. They'll see the skills that you have. What they really are wanting to, to know is that you can synthesize your information into a short amount of time. So yeah, I would say try and take an insight, something interesting that they've never heard before that's unique to you. Mm. I, I would agree. I mean, I think if you don't have to do it chronologically, I would say think about three, think about three projects and think about them in terms of people, process and performance. So yeah. pick a project where there was a problem. There was an issue with people, um, whether that was because you were going out into the community to design a community project, there was some kind of issue that needed to be resolved and talk about how that worked. So obviously you can talk about the the design and the, and the structure as well, but but talk about the people aspects of it. Pick a project where performance was an issue. So you had a, a real deadline, you had a, a very strong budget restraints where you kind of smashed it. So talk mm. about how, what was it you personally did to get that project over the line? And then I would talk about one about process. So where was there technical difficulties? Where was there an issue that needed to be resolved that really required some very specific understanding? Because that way you're showing people performance process. There really isn't anything else in, in any work anywhere that doesn't fall under one of those three categories. And if you've got three projects, you could talk two or three minutes for each one. In 10 minutes, you've explained you can do people process and, and performance. It, yeah. it, and then you could talk about the rest of your portfolio if you have time, but you've showed some real strong skills in that short, short first first section. Mm. People want the juicy information, don't they? They want they want the the interesting ways that you've overcome challenges, those sorts of things. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good point. And also the the last bit I would add to that as well is if you think about what a job is there's a gap they need there's a problem in the business there's something there so a bit like what sean said earlier if you can kind of you probably get some clues into the job interview or another good thing is always to ask a question beforehand you know if there's anything in particular you'd like me to show and they might say all right we need technical drawings on reddit and then you've kind of got a clue what's really important there because yeah. that's big part of the job isn't it finding out what, what the interview is looking for and showcasing that but brilliant so we've actually got a compliment from Mar from margaret which i'll read out and then we've got one last question from benjamin and this is all working perfectly nicely so i'm hoping we have a little bit of time because i really want to ask emma one more question but you can, yes, you can we'll ask wherever we'll ask. you want if <laughs> emma's got the time i got the time uh, <laughs> So Margaret has said, um, this is great, useful advice that can be applied to people who already work and are growing their career in the workplace. Thanks, guys. My pleasure, our pleasure. And yeah, remember after this, if you want to follow up with Tara or Emma and me, we're all on LinkedIn. So drop us a message. That's what all this is about. So Benjamin, ooh, Benjamin has got an interview coming up. So hopefully, Benjamin, you bear with us and you stay here and we can offer some insight. <laughs> So uh, Ben says, hi everyone, first time catching one of these live. Thank you for hosting. I have my first virtual university interview for a part two tomorrow and was wondering what to expect and how this might differ from a professional interview. I'm in practice now, but didn't have any interviews as part of my undergraduate uh, applications. Thank you. Okay, cool. So I was a part two and I have done this interview and I was nervous as heck. So I totally get it. 
And you're like, oh my gosh, what's going on there? And so this is just based upon my experience. So I was nervous as well. And when I went to one or two of these interviews and I had two of them. I had one at one, one called the University of Westminster, which was a little bit like a speed run. It was a bit like speed dating. And I didn't feel like there was so much of a rapport then. And that was physical back in the day. But what I this sounds like to me is a lot more like what I did on my part two interview at Manchester School of Architecture where I went there. And so first of all, like any other interview, no one is there trying to trick you. They're, what this is all about is them understanding what your passion is about. And what I would say, Ben, is that the reason I got in Manchester School of Architecture is because I went there, I was super nervous before, and my dad took me all the way to Manchester, and I remember I had a coffee before, and I spilled it on my shirt, and I was panicking, <laughs> I was panicking and all this stuff, and then I went into the room, and I just let it go, and I was like, I was in this room with this lady who was fantastic called Helen, and we just spoke from the heart, and she talked to me about what my passions were, I talked to her about what I did in my year out in terms of architecture practice, and then we went through my um, uh, the projects, and I was really direct and concise, and so actually it ties in with everything we just said i did an overview but i talked about my most recent project in my part one i talked about my year out and i talked about the kind of stuff that i would be really interested in learning at manchester school of architecture and i did a little bit of that research before so i kind of um, went online i saw all their projects from before and i talked about what i really would love to do with that emphasis a bit like what emma said i was at the edge of my seat like i really want to go to this uni i really want to do this <laughs> stuff and that came across so what i predict ben is it's going to be a lot about finding about who you are you're going to be doing this online so maybe it's about showcasing the best of what you've done and my top tip would be to show your most recent part one show your work and your year out and because it's a zoom interview online Give them the scope to ask you any questions, but do have one or two questions as well. Maybe remember to smile. Maybe use some of Emma's tips earlier. Get your proportions right. <laughs> Get your proportions right. And make sure that the microphone and, and, you, and the video all works because until physical, that's actually super important because um, what I, I, an interesting statistic that I learned from YouTube is that People are more likely to pay attention if the video quality is bad, but the sound is good. However, if the sound quality is bad, people just switch off because they just can't, they can't understand the tone of what we're talking about and they can't understand the, um, the actual words. So Ben, hopefully that's helpful for me. I'll bring up the question now, if Tara or Emma, you want to jump in on some thoughts on that and then we can uh, just freestyle from there really. I think you really, answered that question very well. I think I don't really have much experience with part two interview, so I think you've hit the nail on the head again. <laughs> All right. I, I would say don't don't treat it any differently than you would from any other professional interview. Prepare, mm. turn up, be the expert that you are, show your passion, do exactly what you would do if you were going for a job that was that you were going to be paid for. Mm. Yeah. Important. Well said, well said. Well, I think we've got, we've got, we've got questions coming in. I mean, Maria talks about what we touched upon earlier. So Maria, don't worry, this will be all be on YouTube and me and Tara have our course as well. So you can flick back because we talked a little bit about if you don't have experience, you know, should you be worried and all this stuff. So Maria, check that out at the start. And also you can follow up with us as well. So I'm conscious we're going around the hour mark. I've got a bit of time as well, but look, I know everyone's mm. is busy. Um, Tara, you said you maybe you want one or two quick questions for Emma. Emma, if you've got one or two more minutes, um, yeah, it'd be yeah. great. Yeah, cool. I think so. One uh, thing that Emma and I had talked about, and she she talked about women in interviews, and I think this was really interesting for me. The the idea about women use more have a tendency to use more collaborative language. And I think this is fascinating and I think it would be great to unpack this a little bit about the difference between what types of language we, women tend to use. Yeah, so there's, there's lots and lots of research on this. So because women tend to work collaboratively generally and they're really, really good at it, which is an, an amazing skill in, a work, in the workplace, unfortunately what we do is when, we come, when it comes to our um, achievements, we say we and not I. So you probably were working as part of a team, but there were certain aspects of that work that you were solely responsible for. But we say we, not I. 
So I was, mm. you know, so I did this to get this project over the line. So one of the things I found really interesting about, so we say we, and it, it undermines our expertise, it undermines the value that we have personally brought to that particular project. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things that we need to watch out for. So yeah. how would you, how do you overcome that? Do you, is it more that you would just say I? Yeah, you, well, number one, you've got to notice. Mm. So there, there's a, you know, we, we do all these things all the time and we don't notice that we're doing them. So first of all, start noticing. Number two, don't give yourself a hard time about it. Because yeah. it, it's ubiquitous. It happens everywhere. It's not you. Um, so don't give yourself a hard time. And then start to notice when it happens and start to change it. So, oh, look, I did that again. Oh, I said we. I did it on, um, uh, I was doing a webinar the other day and I said we. And I, and I stopped myself and I said, actually, sorry, no, we didn't do anything. I did it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and just kind of made a joke of it because I think it's important to kind of go, we, we just have to be nice to ourselves when we notice ourselves doing it and start to change it gently and with encouragement rather than nothing gets changed by, you know, beating yourself up over it. So mm. just do it really nice and gently. It's and great. Then it's like avoiding sorries and just, I'm just going to take a minute to go to my portfolio. Yeah, you know, that's we'll a great. A moment. So again, we're diminishing our space. We're diminishing our expertise. We're saying, I'm really sorry for disturbing you because you're very high status and I'm low. So it's those kind of tiny little things that mm. undermine our, our expertise. And men tend not to do it and women tend to do it a little bit more. Mm. Yeah, I, I mean, even when you said it, when you were saying it to me, I was thinking, oh gosh, I say we all the time. I Sometimes I say just, I just want to do this, or <laughs> you just have a moment, I think, oh gosh, I need to give myself more credit, you know, and put myself forward more and be more confident. But as you say, it takes time, you've got to be nice to yourself, and that's a skill yeah. that you develop. Definitely, definitely. It's it's interesting how, and I've got it myself, where you feel like you speak normally and then sometimes you have a bit of banter at work. And I remember I was down the pub once and, there, and, and my friend would be like, oh, you always say this expression or this word. And then once you're aware of it and you hear yourself do it, it can drive you insane. My, one of my pet peeves, which is interesting, is the but. When people go, I think this and this, but. And I'm just like, dude, everything before a but is like... That's just you being political. That's not real. <laughs> however, what are this? Well, that's what I was going to say. However, I've learned that however is a really soft way to say a but, which opens the conversation. <laughs> and oh, it's like I'm like the Messiah here. So I up in the <laughs> Your light's just gone funny. <laughs> yeah, I. But uh, that's what I've learned. Is oh, I'm saying but and however now. <laughs> yeah. I try to not say but, and when I do, yeah. I like to do however because. I've learned that if you're delivering news or a sentence which actually requires a but, the other person, in my opinion, has got their guard up because I'm registered when I hear a but to be like defensive and yeah. normally people do that. So when I try to, in terms of give feedback on CVs and portfolios, I will always say, this is great. Uh, however, have you looked at maybe flipping the formula up or doing that and that normally is much is received much better than me going this is great but have you flipped it around because they go oh, so you think i should just flip it around yeah. yeah i have my my pet peeve is that is basically and essentially so I'm oh basically. Basically. basically oh i use that sometimes <laughs> basically so i was i try to get people to switch it from basically to essentially because it sounds um, much more important, but then it's just swapping one word for another. So it, it's hard. It's a hard habit to to change. Yeah. Do you yeah. have a pet peeve, Emma? It, my husband's a basically a drive. Oh, he's a basically. <laughs> I'm so in tune to it too now. It's like basically. Oh no. <laughs> really annoys me. Uh, the other thing that the thing that I notice a lot again, again, more women than men do this, but they say so. So I'm going to tell you about such and such. <laughs> or, so this is oh, God. rather than I'm going to tell you about such and such. I do that. Yes. We worked on. So so really kind of weakens the beginning of a sentence. Really decide what your first word Passive. is and just say it. I just yeah. I noticed actually there's a uh, Zahal has asked about introducing yourself, and I would say okay. that's one of the things. Is, Where is this? Um, oh yeah, that's a great question. We should quickly answer that. Uh, yeah, sure. Just How whack do you it up. answer yourself? Um, you know, 
decide exactly what you're going to say. You don't need to give your whole history because <laughs> you know with, there, there isn't time. Nobody wants to know that much. But so pick out what are the really pertinent bits. Decide exactly how you're going to start your first sentence and start with that word. So yeah, I did such and such and such and such rather than so when I was at university that it, it yeah. weakens it already. So you have to be really concise about what it is you are telling them. And remember that you're telling them not for historical reasons. You're telling who you are for where you're trying to get to. Mm. It's a completely different thing. Mm. Yeah? So that's just a, a list of all the things that you've done. This is, I'm telling you this bit here because it's pertinent about where I want to get to. Mm. Well, Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I like what I you're saying about so. That's terrible. I say that all the time. What I did was I replaced um with so. <laughs> and so now, <laughs> now I'm just going to get rid of so. <laughs> Be more yeah, conscious it, of it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I was speaking with Tara before this and talking about one of the podcasts I do. And what I noticed, Emma, is that because I was stressed during the time I was doing it, there was lots going on. And while normally I feel that I can construct my sentences and speak slower and hopefully get a lot less filler words, when I'm stressed, I go into that other place where I was listening back to my question and it was there. I just went kind of like, so, um, um, but, and, and it was because I was stressed. So I was saying to Tara before, I was like, I felt like taking it off. But at the same time, I was like, do you know what? I'm human. And I was stressed and I will keep it up because it's relatable. Mm. But that's the thing. We're, we're not perfect. We're not perfect and we're humans. And I think that all these tips, when you're in an interview, it's good to have all this theory then. Mm. But you're in the moment and things can, can go out the window and you don't need to do everything we talked about. How, but the, the ingredients of what we're talking about here, I think is really helpful. And while I was saying that sentence, it was awful because I was hearing myself say, but and however. <laughs> and so, so I can't, I can't even talk anymore. I've like jinxed myself. Too conscious. Too, con <laughs> too, too conscious. I what think have you though, done to us, Emma? Oh my gosh. Sorry. I'm really it's sorry. Re <laughs> it's really, it's really helpful. It's really helpful. I think on that note, it's probably a great, uh, time to wrap this up a bit. Sean's a big fan of what you said, Emma. The free peas are a, pra uh, a great approach, and he's going to borrow them uh, for himself. Great. I'm sure that's fine. You too. Sean, drop Emma a message. That's what it's all about. Ben uh, says thank you. Good luck in your Good interview, luck, Ben. ben. Yeah. I am confident you can do it. Uh, be yourself. And hey, hey, hopefully, the stuff we said today will give you one or two tips. Uh, tips. Yeah, let us know so you how you go. It. Let us know. And everyone here has been super cool, and everyone's wishing uh, Ben best of luck. So that's super amazing. Just to round this up at the end, I've been Stephen Drew, your host at the Architecture Social. I should look at the camera and say that. <laughs> and uh, I've been with the fantastic Tara Cole and the fantastic down here, Emma. Emma from Speaking at Work, Tara Carl from Marky Ingrid. Do follow up after this with anyone you want to speak to. I'm going to end the live stream here now. It's been absolutely a great roller coaster. I've learned a lot about Twitch and, <laughs> and uh, comments then. And we can, hey, I'll close the live stream now. But Emma and Tara, just stay with me one second while the stream ends. Thank you, everyone in the audience. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.